for today. Uh, as Matt mentioned, I'm here to talk to you about my latest book, Anarchy Unbound, Why Self-Governance Works Better Than You Think, uh, which is published by Cambridge University Press. And the purpose in my remarks, which will be brief, uh, and then we can chat, talk, Q&A, whatever you want, uh, is to simply introduce you to the book. I'm not going to go over the entire thing. I'm not going to rehash all of my arguments. I just kind of want to, in very broad and brief strokes, uh, sort of give you a, an idea about what the book is about. Um, at its most fundamental level, it's the culmination of, oh gosh, maybe uh, 10 or 15 years now worth of thinking about anarchy and self-governance more specifically on my part. That was what my uh, doctoral dissertation was on and a good deal of my academic research and an even greater deal of my, uh, my time more generally has been spent thinking about issues surrounding self-governance and anarchy. And so this book was sort of the, when I was approached to do it, uh, I, I leave it the opportunity because it, it offered me the chance to sort of put together, um, as I say, a sort of culmination of my thoughts on this, on this topic and to, to make some of the points say some of the things about this that, uh, that I've wanted to say that I often have talked about when if any of you have seen me lecture um, at universities or at the various typically market-oriented organizations for whom I speak. You've probably heard me talk about some of these themes, but the book gave me a chance to sort of put it all together in a more, more systematic and, and uh, well-articulated, I hope, uh, form. So the, uh, the basic idea, the, the upshot, the purpose of the book is to use economics to analyze what I'm calling the robustness of, of self-governing arrangements, uh, private institutions of social order, to various situations that, according to conventional academic wisdom anyway, um, self-governance should break down, situations in which self-governance should break down according to, according to the conventional wisdom. And... Um, there are, the book is sort of broken into four major sections, the first three of which address one major situation or problem case, a uh, hard case for anarchy where self-governance is said not to function effectively, in which I use theory and empirical evidence to try and address that claim, to evaluate it. And the fourth book is a little bit different, a little closely related, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, but I want to tell you quickly about those about those first three parts and sort of what's going on with respect to the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom with respect to self-governance has moved beyond Hobbes, uh, I'm, I'm grateful to say. Hobbes, of course, who famously depicted life and anarchy as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Hobbes essentially set the bar for anarchy on the ground. Uh, in his view, I think... Self-governance is not considered at all, and anarchy is, in, in its entirety, bloody chaos. At least modern economic thinking has moved beyond that in the sense that it raises the bar for self-governance a little bit, and it recognized the possibility for, in particular, what's called the uh, discipline of repeated interaction or the discipline of continuous dealings, which is basically a reputation-type mechanism. And it's the simple idea that, you know, even if the state doesn't exist to provide and enforce social rules that might facilitate cooperation, prevent fraud and theft, uh, and so on, uh, what people can simply do is refuse to interact with individuals who break various social rules that either organically emerge or people consciously uh, develop. Uh, and you're all familiar with this mechanism. I'm sure that you use it in your daily lives, despite the existence of government all the time uh, to fill in gaps or, or for other purposes. And uh, this is, to, without a doubt, a critically important institution of self-governance, a mechanism of, of, of privately created uh, and enforced social rules. Um, having said that, there is much more, and this is a point that I sort of harp on in the book, there is much more to self-governance than that particular mechanism. And the reason that that point is important is that the circumstances, the what I call hard cases for anarchy, according to, that according to conventional wisdom lead self-governance to break down, are in fact circumstances in which the discipline of continuous dealings, that particular mechanism of self-governance I just described, by itself breaks down. That doesn't, of course, necessarily imply that self-governance more generally breaks down. But to get to that point, we have to first recognize that indeed there are self-governing mechanisms and institutions 
besides the discipline of continuous dealings. So what are those cases? Those correspond to each of the three first parts of the book. Uh, the first case deals with situations in which populations of individuals are large, consist of a lot of people, and they consist of socially diverse people. And the idea here, according to conventional wisdom, is that in order for that ostracism or boycott or reputation type mechanism described by the discipline of continuous dealings to work, you need to satisfy several basic conditions. Uh, those conditions include, for example, the ability of individuals to communicate the history of various members of the group to other members of the group. So, for example, if someone in our population cheats and we want to ostracize them, which is the only way in which that rule is going to be effective, we need to be able to communicate ideally to every other member of the group that that person has cheated such that we can all coordinate on ostracizing that person in order to provide the maximal incentive for that person to not break the rule in the first place. Obviously, as the size of the population grows, the cost and more generally the difficulty of communicating information about the history of individuals grows with it, which, according to conventional wisdom, can lead this reputation-type mechanism to suffer some defects, to, to break down, to have problems. When you make that large population socially diverse, and by that I mean imagine, for example, people who speak different languages, have different religious beliefs or different philosophies on life more generally, any sort of dimension of diversity that you want to think about, the, the information sharing component that's required for the discipline of continuous dealings to function becomes still harder yet to, to convey. For instance, think simply about imagine the world in which uh, people didn't know, a population was, con was composed of a large number of people with different, who spoke different languages, none of them shared the same language. In that case, it's going to be more difficult, for example, or at least more costly, to communicate, again, the identity of cheaters, which is going to make reputation or boycott less effective, which is going to cause, according to conventional wisdom, self-governance to face problems to break down. So the first section of the book is spent addressing that particular problem. The second section of the book addresses uh, a second case in which the discipline of continuous dealings by itself faces difficulty producing social cooperation. And that is when there are large asymmetries in the physical strengths of the members of society. So for example, if you um, steal something from my store and I declare that I'm never going to trade with you again and I'm furthermore going to spread information about the fact that you are a cheater, you're a shoplifter to other purveyors of whatever it is that I sell, your ability to engage in trades, and thus the punishment that you face, a la the discipline of continuous dealings, is going to be hopefully severe enough to prevent you from doing so. But now suppose that you are extraordinarily strong physically, and I am extraordinarily weak, or that you have something like a monopoly on technology of violence, and I don't. Well, in that case, my threat to ostracize you may not be very effective, because what you can simply do, whether or not I or other members of the merchant community, for instance, declare that we're never going to trade with you because you're stronger than us, you can simply sort of run roughshod over our property rights, walk into our stores, knocking us over the head with a club and taking whatever it is that you want. That's a very crude way of putting it, but that hopefully gives you some intuition about why it is that the discipline of continuous dealings, according to conventional wisdom, can break down when there are these physical uh, strength disparities that lead to the potential for violence. A different way of putting this is that reputation or ostracism type mechanisms can be quite successful in certain circumstances, again, at preventing peaceful theft, but they are not particularly robust to their ability to solve problems of what we might call violent theft, those which involve the threat of physical force along the lines of what I described a second ago. The third section of the book considers the last hard case for anarchy that I, that I uh, focus on, which is what I call the problem of bad apples. And there the difficulty is, what do we do? How is it that the discipline of continuous dealings, according to conventional wisdom, uh, how, how can that mechanism support cooperation when, for example, we've got people in society who, because, for instance, they have very high discount rates, they're very impatient, uh, tend to as a way of life or habitually engage in antisocial conduct. Now, in order for the discipline of continuous dealings to be effective, 
right? Remember what the, that mechanism is doing is threatening in terms of punishment, cutting an individual who breaks a social rule off from future cooperative interactions with the other members of the population. That means the punishment that such an individual suffers as a result of being cut off depends upon the present discounted value of the stream of future interactions he or she would have had. That value, the present discounted value, obviously depends on that individual's discount rate. Where a, an individual discounts the future very heavily, what they're giving up, even if they're cut off via ostracism, for example, if they cheat, from other individuals is very small relative to what they stand to gain. So this bad apple problem, these people with high discount rates is sort of one way to think about it, although in the book I discuss other types of bad apples, can, according to conventional wisdom, lead self-governance to break down. Without going into what my theoretical and empirical responses are in each of these different cases, uh, I want to simply point out that in a nutshell, what the conventional wisdom with respect to self-governance is saying is that in situations X, Y, and Z, it's more difficult, it's very hard, let's say, for individuals to develop self-governing solutions or to use self-governance, by which they mean the discipline of continuous dealings again, in order to produce social cooperation. And I think that that part is right. What the conventional wisdom misses, which is sort of underlying my responses in each part of the book um, to the conventional wisdom arguments, what it misses is that while it's true that it's more difficult, it's also true that in each of those cases, the cost to individuals of failing to develop private solutions to those problem situations are enormous. They're higher than they are ordinarily. Um, and in a way, you could sort of think about what I'm doing is simply using the law of demand, right? The idea in this case where the cost is higher of failing to solve the problems, people are going to engage in less failing to solve those problems, which is the same way of saying they're going to be more likely to solve those problems. That's the sort of very simple underlying logic that's sort of guiding what's happening in the empirics that I discuss um, or that I adduce to sort of address these issues and in the somewhat more sophisticated and elaborate particulars of the theory in each particular case. It's that simple recognition that Yes, these are hard cases, but precisely because they're hard cases, failing to solve them for the individuals who are actually involved involves much higher costs, which, ceteris paribus, means those individuals are more likely to develop solutions to those problems, not less likely. Okay, the fourth part of the book, which is the last thing I want to say about this in terms of introducing the book to you, uh, the fourth part of the book addresses what is a very common, uh, if you debate anarchy with your friends or foes or anyone in between. Uh, I'm sure you've encountered this claim. It's a very common, but also I think uh, a very sensible question that's posed to those who are pushing the possibility or exploring the possibility of self-governance or self-governing solutions to various problems that individuals enjoy, uh, that I'm sorry, that they confront. And that issue is, well, if self-governance is so effective, if it works as well as you claim, point out to me the societies in the actual world that we inhabit or historically has been inhabited where that is based on self-governance and is materially more prosperous or at least not massively less prosperous than any number of societies that I can point to you that are governed by states uh, historically and today. And it's, it's the sort of um, the, the wealthy anarchic society is a kind of unicorn of anarchism uh, if, if you want to think it about, if you want to think about it that way, and that's what the fourth part of the book discusses. And my basic argument there, my basic argument there, is that it is indeed possible to find this anarchic unicorn or this anarchy unicorn. Uh, you just have to know how to look for it. Uh, and to sort of motivate my my basic point here, um, although I don't I don't use this tact in the book, but Many of you, or perhaps not, presumably some of you at least, have had discussions or debates with people about what welfare was like, uh, whether or not the Industrial Revolution constituted a welfare improvement or not for the people who lived in, in, say, 18th century England. And the 
sort of non-economic view, the way that someone who has not been introduced to or trained in the economic way of thinking approaches the problem, is typically to point to the low wages, poor working conditions, long hours, and so on, uh, that work during the Industrial Revolution entailed. Now, when they're using the word low, poor, inferior, and so on, implicitly what they have in mind, of course, as the point of relevant comparison, are the wages that people in developed countries enjoy today. That, for example, workers in England, what are their wages today? What are their safety conditions today? How long do they work today uh, compared to the Industrial Revolution? Someone who's been trained in the economic way of thinking, um, and I, I hope this is all of you, will point out to such an individual that, in fact, that comparison makes no sense. And the reason it makes no sense is that we don't have time machines. Um, or a slightly different way of putting that is that we live in a world of constraints, a world of scarcity. The constraints in terms of our wealth that individuals confronted during the Industrial Revolution did not make available to them, given how wealthy society was, or how relatively unwealthy that society was. Higher wages, shorter working hours, improved sanitary conditions, and so on. So comparing Industrial Revolution era standards on those dimensions to modern day standards in the US or England or pick some other Western European country of your choosing doesn't make sense. It's an irrelevant comparison. Instead, what we need to do is to compare how individuals fared in Industrial Revolutionary England to how they fared in the situation before the Industrial Revolution in England. That is, in fact, the relevant comparison because that world, that alternative, consists of an opportunity that was, in fact, actually available to those during in Industrial Revolution era England. And compared to that, most economists agree that it looks like most uh, industrial laborers during this period, in fact, enjoyed significant gains. So it's all about finding the relevant comparison point. The reason, again, that relevant comparison point is so important is because we live in a world of constrained opportunity sets, which is to use very basic economics again, another way of saying that we live in a world of scarcity. My point with respect to the anarchic unicorn is very similar to this. It's essentially that you need to find what the relevant comparison is. What is in fact the governance alternatives to self-governance, for example, in a place like Somalia, um, that's in the actual governance opportunity set available to citizens in that country. And my point in particular, much of this part of the book deals with Somalia, although not all of it, um, the reason being that Somalia is, of course, the most well-known case of a stateless society uh, today. And it's also the case that those who like to uh, mock people who, who think it's fun to explore anarchy with the claim, why don't you move to, to Somalia? Um, the, the point, which is part of the reason why I focus so much on it in the book, also because there, there are data available that help us explore this issue, but in any event, the point is that implicitly what many of these people seem to have in mind when they wring their hands over the uh, poverty that uh, supposedly attends statelessness in Somalia since 1991 is in fact something like the level of development in the country that they live in, which is typically, again, the United States or a extraordinarily wealthy European country. What they neglect, again, is that in a world of scarcity where countries face constrained governance opportunity sets. The United States has a very different governance opportunity set than Somalia for historical and other reasons, which means that unless one thinks that it is very likely or relatively easy to choose extraordinarily high-functioning first world democratic type institutions for Somalia and have them function the same way, that is not the relative po uh, point of comparison for welfare in Somalia. In other words, it's wrong to say An Somalia under anarchy is poor because I can point to the United States, which is wealthy. Instead, what needs to be done is, a la the Industrial Revolution type case, think about what are the governance opportunities that are actually in Somalia's governance set, which we know includes, for example, its most recent experience under government, which collapsed in 1991. And if you actually compare what happened with welfare or development in Somalia in its, in its period of experience under government, the last time it had it, to, his, to its experience under anarchy, at least as far as the data go up that I've collected, 
Somalia unequivocally does better off under anarchy. So there we have found a case of a materially more prosperous anarchic society. The key is it's relative to the actual state-governed society that it might have, not relative to the pie-in-the-sky, unconstrained, no-scarcity world where we can pick any sort of institutions that we want for Somalia. There, if you use that, then I agree. We can't find a wealthy anarchic society. But the point is, wealthy is, should be relative to what the alternatives are in its opportunity set in terms of what level of wealth those would generate. And there, the data seems to bear out, uh, or at least is highly suggestive, of uh, having found an anarchic unicorn in Somalia. And moreover, as the fourth part of my book discusses, uh, with a decent probability, this applies to other least developed countries as well, many of them in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, with that, uh, I've already spoken far too long. I will stop, and hopefully that gives you a sense of kind of where I'm coming from, what the book is about. Um, hopefully it makes you interested enough to want to, to read it in its entirety, and I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you. I have no idea how this operates, by the way. Uh, thank you, Peter. We're going to open it up for questions now. Um, how would you respond to critics who would claim that anarchy is only better than states with bad or corrupt institutions? I would say that that's an empirical question, but even if they're right, that's giving away a ton. Because what they don't realize is that the vast majority of governments in the world are governments that are incredibly corrupt and have what you described as horrible institutions. They don't recognize that if you were just pulling balls out of an urn, so to speak, that represented the different qualities of government empirically that we find in the world. Overwhelmingly, if they were pulling randomly, the polls would look much more like the governments of Sierra Leone, for example, than they would look like the government in Germany. And so I would say, even if they are right, what they've just done is essentially acknowledge that for the majority of the world, anarchy would be the, the most preferred form of governance. Absolutely. Um, and we've got another one, also mine. Uh, do you think that there are any promising paths toward anarchy for those of us who do buy into this argument that are realistic given the public perception of anarchy and also the insights of public choice? No. <laughs> I don't. Um, for a whole host of reasons, I don't. I think that, look, kind of one thing that we have going for us, again, take the case of Somalia, the international community, had, or at least important, prominent members of the international community, have wanted Somalia to return to centralized government in the southern part of the country, essentially since civil war broke out in, in, 19, in the early 1990s, 1991. Uh, and they have put a good deal of effort into trying to make that happen. So far, uh, arguably at least, they've been unsuccessful. And so the sort of public choice considerations that create tremendous inertia or status quo bias more generally in state-oriented societies can also create that kind of status quo bias or inertia, uh, perhaps with some... I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest this is the only reason that Somalia has, has persisted, um, so that anarchy has persisted in Somalia, but I do think it is one of the reasons. But the point is that that, that inertia or, or those stakeholders have strong incentives to continue things are to continue things along the way that they have uh, that they have that they have been so far. So you can sort of flip those public choice considerations around and use them to uh, be optimistic about continued statelessness in Somalia if that is for you a cause of optimism. All right, I like that. Um, got a question from BK Marcus. I haven't read your piracy book. Could you tell us how it relates to your work on anarchy? Sure. Um, I'll tell you a little bit, and then I'll encourage you to, to read The Invisible Hook and to read Anarchy Unbound, because uh, one of the chapters in Anarchy Unbound is about statelessness among Caribbean pirates. So there is overlap between the two. Uh, the basic relationship between them is that as outlaws, 18th century Caribbean pirates, which are the pirates... When you think of pirates, these are like Blackbeard and Jack Rackham and, you know, pirates of the, 
pirates from Disney World. These, these are those pirates that we're talking about. Because they were criminals, they couldn't rely on any state or any government to make sure, for example, that they didn't steal from one another, that they didn't kill one another, that more generally they got along with one another and cooperated. Nevertheless, social cooperation, especially among bands of thieves, was indispensable for pirates in order for them to be able to coordinate in plundering merchant ships. You know, a, mer a pirate ship could typically, the average one consisted of like 80 to 100 guys. That's a lot of rogues, and these are people who are committed to theft and murder as a way of life. So imagine trying to coordinate those individuals, all self-interested, in the absence of any overarching or sort of centralized authority. That was the problem situation that pirates confronted, uh, which is actually one of the hard problem situations that I discuss in, in Anarchy Unbound. And the way, in short, that pirates solved this problem was by developing a private system of constitutional democracy, replete with uh, checks and balances and separated power that, in an interesting turn, anticipated uh, American-style, and it looks very similar in many respects, American-style constitutional democracy by more than half a century. All right, um, we've got a question from Travis, the green man, uh, the green guy, uh, McCurry. Uh, I'm looking at possibly making your social reputation system you were talking about. What would be the most important aspects of it, and can it exist now even under a state? And if so, how would it work different than under pure anarchy? Okay, I don't know what you mean by you're considering making it, um, but I can tell... You can come back at me with that in a second. Let me tell you a little bit about how it works under a state and or under anarchy, and then maybe, maybe that will answer, answer your question. Um, the easiest way to think about it is sort of, and I hesitate to go down this path because, again, I, I made the caveat early, earlier about my, the tech savvy of a 90-year-old. So if this, is, if this analogy is mistaken, then, then disregard it. Uh, but the eBay reputation system is essentially like the a reputation system based on the discipline of continuous dealings. You're leaving feedback, that's, or it could be Amazon's repu, uh, star system, or lots of online sellers have these things now. You're leaving feedback about whether or not the person that you purchased from, for example, or vice versa, followed through on their exchange in, or complied more generally with the implicit contract that you had with them to deliver goods or services at a particular type and quantity at a particular price at a particular point in time or not. And uh, note that those systems, those reputation systems, exist under states. We live in a world with, you know, I live in the United States. I don't know where you live, Travis, probably the United States too. Those mechanisms exist even though we have a government. You might ask yourself, by the way, well, why is that so? Given, you know, doesn't the state make sure that Joe Schmo seller uh, on Amazon won't rip me off because if he does, then I can sue him in court. Um, on some level, yes, the state does do that. So the question is, why does the reputation system emerge anyway? And the reason is that in many, many cases, the cost of actually appealing to the formal government institutions of contract enforcement, for example, are far too high relative to the potential gain. So in practice, we live in what I like to call, in many cases, de facto anarchy, everyday anarchy. It's true that in principle, the state stands by ready to ensure contracts, but the costliness of doing so in practice means that for all intents and purposes, there is no state enforcing my various interactions of certain types with people, such as those on, uh, that I might transact on eBay. And so to fill in those holes, those governance gaps, Reputation mechanisms, in this case in an online format, emerge. Uh, how they would look under anarchy, I think they would look very, very similar, although they would probably be even more extensive than they are today, which is hard to imagine if you know much about reputation mechanisms because they are extraordinarily extensive today. They pervade virtually every type of interaction that you have, whether it be a social interaction with friends or your interaction with a banker when you're getting a mortgage. There are reputational components to everything. You know, if you're, think about it, if, if there's a guy who's a new person in your friend group or an old person in your friend group, 
and he just starts acting like a jerk occasionally. Ostracism is one way that you solve that problem, that you hope to get him in line. That's social boycott, that's reputation. Perhaps you even gossip about him, which is another form of information spreading via reputation. By the same token, why is it that, using the mortgage example, banks spend money advertising to try and convince you that to use them versus other banks? One of the ways in which they do that is by appealing to their reputations as guys who invest wisely, who are good stewards of funds, who aren't going to abscond with your money once you immediately deposit it. So reputation is again working there to help enforce uh, inter uh, commercial interactions as well. So reputation is pretty much always everywhere. Uh, that would be under both government and anarchy. I don't know if that helps you in terms of, of making reputation, uh, whatever, what, I don't know, because I'm not sure what you meant by that, but hopefully that's helpful. I got a question from Cameron Bell. What works would you suggest to gain a basis or framework for competently studying these endogenous solutions to governance? Uh, the self-serving answer is this book. Is this book right here? I think that. I think that uh, more seriously, I, I do think that my book would be helpful uh, and following the references contained therein. But um, there are many excellent books on anarchy and self-governance that precede mine. Some of my favorites, uh, the ones that influenced my thinking, particularly as a younger man the most, include uh, David Friedman's Machinery of Freedom. It's a classic. I love it. Um, Bruce Benson's work, uh, Law Without... Oh, gosh, what's the name? Uh, law Without... Oh, wait. I lost it. I can't remember it either. Uh, law Without Order, or Order Without Law, is Robert Ellickson's book, which is also fantastic. But Bruce Benson's book, I have to look it up. I, can't, I, I think Matt may be looking it up for us right now. Anyway, it's fantastic. We're going to get the title of that for you in a second. Can you find it? Uh, the Enterprise of Law, Justice Thank Without... The Enterprise of Law, that's right. Fantastic book. So Ellickson's book, Order Without Law, The Enterprise of Law by Benson, The Machinery of Freedom by David Friedman, and Anarchy and Bound by me. That's what I would suggest you start with. All right. Uh, another question from BK. The 19th century French liberals believed that the ancient world's examples of individual liberty came at the cost of outsiders. Greece and... And it looks like that one got cut off. Um, BK, if you have the, uh, the rest of that question, I'd be excited to add it. Uh, Greece and Rome fed off slavery and conquest. So he's saying that uh, basically the internal liberty of a society came at the expense of expansion and imperialism, I think. Okay. Well, I see the, the end of his question here, which is, can anarchy be compatible with a peaceful foreign policy? He says he's asking because of pirates. Um, I don't see any reason why anarchy cannot be compatible with foreign policy. I'm not sure how I see this connecting to pirates, so you can, again, ask more to help me, to help guide me here. But, um, yeah, I don't see, you know, on one level, so it's important to note that Here's, I guess I would pose the, I would, I would phrase it this way. Do you believe that at present the work, foreign policy as in general observed in the world, is it peaceful or not? I would say that in general it's quite peaceful. It's true that there are very aggressive elements and that sometimes uh, wars break out, right? But war, international conflict, seems to me to be the exception, not the rule. That happens despite the fact that globally, of course, we exist under global anarchy. There is no supranational sovereign to oversee uh, these affairs between states, at least not one that has formal enforcement power. And despite that situation of international anarchy, we tend to observe peace, not war. Again, with lots of exceptions. Um, I don't think that that's what your question was getting at, so I'm probably not addressing precisely what you wanted to know, but that's the sort of way, the way that I, I think about statelessness and, and foreign policy. If what you had in mind, or if what, if what you have in mind is sort of at the domestic level, 
I'm not sure how I would respond to it because I don't know what it means for a stateless society to have a foreign policy. Um, so I would need to be, I need to hear some more details from you on that. All right. Uh, I think that's it for us at the moment for the questions. I'm going to do a last call while I say thank you to uh, Professor Leeson for being with us today. I've just posted the Amazon link to his book in the chat. Definitely check that out. I'm really excited about picking it up. Um, everybody take care and thanks for, thanks for being with us today. Uh, our next session is going to be Sunday night with Jeffrey Tucker as part of his Liberty Classics series. He's going over Resist Not Evil by Clarence Darrow. So definitely join us. Uh, hope to see you there. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, guys.